Hi, welcome to Sustain Talks. Today I'm joined by Johnny Sadler, Strategic Decarbonisation Manager at Electricity Northwest. Hi, Johnny, how are you? Hi, Sam, really good. Good to be with you. Yeah, good to have you here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I think uh, there's going to be a lot for people to learn. Um, but why don't you start by telling us a little bit more about your background and your role now? Yeah, sure. So I've been with Electricity Northwest for seven months now. Uh, so still trying to, uh, still very much a new boy in, in this role. But prior to this, I uh, spent six years running the Manchester Climate Change Agency which was a not-for-profit that was set up to drive forward the city's climate change agenda. And then prior to that, I spent 11 years in Manchester City Council, uh, where I, I used to run the environmental strategy team. So um, my background is very much in the world of uh, policy development, partnership development, programme development, trying to drive forward an agenda which has grown in significance and importance, certainly in the last two or three years to the point where environment, climate change and sustainability is increasingly uh, becoming a mainstream agenda. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, you've been in sustainability and environmental for uh, a long time. Um, but what made you get into it and why is it so important to you? Um, I think for me, it's um, it, it's always felt like common sense in a lot of ways. And it's it's been about trying to make things better so I think that there's there's a temptation from some people to assume that it's a, it's a, a, it can be a nice to have can be slightly antipathetic to a, the more well-established economic and social goals that you might find at the city level or an organization level or at a community level and I think my my perspective on on sustainability in its widest sense is unless you've got environment, social and economic objectives all working together in tandem you're going to miss something quite significant so you'll increasingly find that greener cities or greener businesses or greener communities they're happier they're more prosperous they're healthier and they're also a good place for biodiversity for example so for me it's it's always been about trying to make places better in the widest sense as opposed to just working on the environment for the sake of it which is quite a good reason in its own right, but um, you do it properly. You get you you, you can also contribute to some of your uh, your ambitions about economic development, health and social improvement, job creation, etc. Whilst also doing your thing to save the world. Yeah, um, and obviously in the role now, one of your objectives is helping businesses to decarbonize. Can you tell us a little bit more about how how you think that businesses can do that? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the agenda is getting to a really interesting stage now. If, you, if you're a business, this is uh, no longer in the nice to have category. So there are a number of uh, commercial drivers which will increasingly mean that this agenda makes sense for you. So be that driven around reduced energy bills, reduced resource consumption, uh, increased competitiveness, um, increased attractiveness to investors and, and talented workers. There's a load of stuff that's that's pushing and pulling businesses in this direction. And you'll also see that there's an increasingly well-developed national government policy framework where sticks are being dangled in front of businesses to encourage them to act now. Uh, but also there's a, there are a series of policy sticks as well that say, look, we want you to do this because you feel it's the right thing. But if you don't act at the pace and scale that's needed, We've got some national government policy and legislative sticks that we're prepared to to wield in a few years' time if you not if you don't get on board. So, I think um, and that's I think for me that's the right balance. You've got to try and create the space and incentives to allow businesses and individuals to move into this agenda because they think it's the right thing. But on the basis you've got some policy and legislative backstops for those who aren't prepared to to move uh, despite the the motivations um, and incentives that are in place so i think you know all, all, all of that really is me saying i think we're a really exciting and interesting time where this is becoming increasingly mainstream um you asked me about what we what we think businesses can do on um sustainability and, and, and net zero in particular 
we've been on our own journey as an organization for the last three years to try to unpick, okay, um, every business is ultimately going to have to go on this journey. What does it look like for us as an organization that's got a load of buildings and staff and vehicles and supply chains? Um, and there's three things that we've pulled out. It's about 15 things we've done over the last three years, but there's three I'll probably focus on today. Uh, first one, energy efficiency. So LED lighting is a really good example. Um, we've got a project that's going to see us get a payback um, over about five year periods. So a 360k project to replace LEDs in eight of our buildings, five year payback, really good. Um, really attractive to the finance director. Yeah. Um, and we talk to businesses who get paybacks as low as 12 and 24 months, certainly those who are running longer operational periods. So energy efficiency and particularly LED lighting is an absolute no-brainer that businesses yeah. can get on with right now. Um, solar PV, again, we've got a project on to get some solar uh, panels on some more of our buildings. A um, couple of depots at the moment. And we're going to see a payback period of around about 10 years on that project. And it's not that long ago, actually, that payback period for solar PV was more like 20 years. So you're seeing the, the costs of PV panels come down almost every month at the moment. And you, as you see energy prices continue to rise, those payback periods are con going to continue to tumble. Certainly if you're delivering a big program across a number of sites or across some larger buildings, and you've got the economies of scale, I, I, I don't think we're very far away from single figure paybacks on solar PV. And the third, the third action that we see increasingly businesses and individuals are already taking is the shift to electric vehicles. Yeah. So you won't be able to buy a petrol or diesel vehicle after 20, a uh, car or van after 2030. So if not right this moment, now's the, to buy one, now's the time to start thinking about it and planning your future cycles of uh, vehicle replacement, because um, at some point in the next few years, you will be making the shift to an EV. So um, start to start to do that planning now, and we've already started to do that ourselves. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to unpick there, but one of the things that you mentioned was um, your own organization's journey to net zero. What, um, what is the time scale on that? And also, what, what are your views? Because there's a lot of mixed views on net zero, on the word net zero, um, and the wording net zero. Sure. Yeah, I think um, we, we heard really clearly, and this is, well, before three years ago when we made the public commitment, was that talking to our customers and stakeholders, I think zero carbon was probably the, the term at the time people were most familiar with they recognised that we had a level of expertise around the energy industry in particular, obviously because of what we do as a distribution network operator, but we also had a level of expertise and understanding around the technologies that were involved. And that's what led people to call, up, uh, to, to call for us to, to start to play a much more proactive role in helping businesses and individuals get on their own journey to, to zero carbon as it was at the time. Um, and what we wanted to make sure we did was that um, to put ourselves in a position where we could advocate from a very well-informed uh, uh, point of view, we wanted to understand what the journey looked like for ourselves. Um, so that's why we've been on this journey for the last three years. And it's how we've arrived at, you know, those 15 actions we've delivered and the three that we're really confident the vast majority of businesses can deliver. So, um, you know, we're slightly ahead of the curve. Um, but what we've tried to do is we've tried to do things that are relevant to any type of business, irrespective yeah. of the sector that they're in. Um, irrespective of their size, large, medium or, or, or small, to try and distill out for people, OK, in an agenda which can re feel really huge at times, let's draw out a handful of really quite practical actions that businesses can get on with now. Worry a little bit less about what you'll need to do in five, six, ten years' time. Um, we can start to tee that up now, but there's, there are a handful, two or three really practical actions that we can all be getting on with today. Yeah, I, I think and there's, a, there's some great tips there um, for any business to be able to do it. Um, but what is, what's your role in this as an electricity distributor uh, helping those companies? 
Yeah. So um, if you go back kind of 10, 15 years, um, we we probably wouldn't have been having this conversation, <laughs> Sam. People wouldn't have wanted to talk to a distribution network operator. So we're, you know, we have been historically a behind the scenes infrastructure provider. We would talk to developers who want to plug a new development into the network. We talk to local authorities. The only other time you might need to talk to us is if your power had gone off. Mm. Okay, so um, historically, fairly behind the scenes infrastructure provider. That that all starts to change about 10, 15 years ago when people start to adopt things like solar panels, for example. Um, fast forward a couple of years on, people are starting to adopt electric vehicles and then more recently making the shift to, to, to heat pumps. And our role in that is firstly to make sure the network has got the capacity is as simple as that. So we we own, invest in, and maintain the electricity distribution network across the Northwest. So we've just got to make sure you can plug your kit in and it's got enough capacity. Um, so that's that's the first thing that we and the other five DNOs across, across Great Britain have got to do is very much focused on the capacity and the reliability of the network, non-negotiable, that's what you've got to do if you want to get your, your license to operate from off gem. But the second role that we and other DNOs are starting to play is, is a much more proactive role upstream, talking to our customers to say, look, this is going really well. There's lots of uh, PV, for example, in this part of the region, but there's a huge gap over here. So because we've now got that expertise about how these different technologies work in different um different types of building in different communities, we're now in a much better position to, to intervene much earlier and say, we recognise you might need some support in a range of different technologies. Can we sit down with you and talk you through what it might mean for your business, for your community, for your, for your household, and just put in place some of that more practical advice and support that, that we've, we've heard customers been have been asking for so in a nutshell firstly sort the network out make sure it's got the capacity and reliability that our customers need and then secondly provide that that support um to help them go on their own journeys to net zero yeah and i guess a lot of companies are wondering about that capacity and a lot of people wondering about that capacity if we all switch to electric vehicles now and we were all using more electric um would there be enough? Where well, is there enough electricity? Uh, the, the short answer is is yes, um, and there's probably a few, a few bits to to the answer. So, in terms of the the network itself, so the the, the network that that we run and the other five DNOs run across across Great Britain, we do two things basically to make sure that the, the network's got capacity. Um, we forecast there'll be between a two and a two and a half times increase in the in capacity uh, between now and 2050. And we do a couple of things, more wires, so more physical infrastructure, uh, more overhead lines, more, 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 um, more wires in the ground. But the second thing that we do is uh, what are called flexible services. So trying to incentivize people and businesses to use and generate their energy in a, in a different and more flexible way. So um, what you will find is there are particular kinds of constraints on, on, on networks at different times of the day. First thing in the morning and between kind of 4 and 7 p.m. when people come home from, from school and work. And it's that peak demand that's a real issue for, for, for people like ourselves. So what what you're increasingly going to see is people being incentivized to shift some of their energy demands to different times of the day. So, you know, if you're a, a manufacturer, might you be able to shift your more energy intensive processes to uh, during the middle of the night when wind turbines are still turning um, and there's a lot of spare capacity on the grid? Can your energy intensive processes be shifted to them? Um, you will see this increasingly coming into the domestic market. You can already buy products where your, your dishwasher, your washing machine, for example, can be set to um, come on at times when there's some uh, additional capacity on the on the grid and on the on the networks. So there's a there's a there's a significant part of this which is around um, 
using energy at different times of the day rather than focused into these two short peak periods. Um, the second part of this, which is really important, is around, is around storage. So, you know, mentioned wind turbines, but the wind blows when it blows, the sunshine when it, it shines, that doesn't necessarily correlate with when um, the demand for energy is. So alongside changing uh, patterns of energy use, um, more capacity for storing energy whenever it happens to be generated is going to be really important. And those two things together will mean that the... Um, the supply of energy will match up with the demand uh, for electricity, despite the, the increases in demand that we, we forecast over the next 20, 30 years. And um, part of that is, I guess, uh, and there's been a lot of change over the last few years with people working from home and, um, you know, using their electricity at home rather than in the buildings that they work with. But one of the things that sometimes gets a bit of negative press, but is smart meters. Is that good for people? Is that going to help them to change the times that they use their energy or even reduce their bills? Yeah, I mean, it's it's fundamentally important, really, to understand how much energy you're using and when in which times of the day you're using. So um, monitoring and managing and management systems is, is certainly one of the one of the recommendations that we make when we start to dig into that energy efficiency side of things in a little bit more detail that I talked about earlier. So whether, whether you're a business or a domestic customer, understanding your energy use is, is, is absolutely critical because yeah. then you're in a much better position to try and reduce it. Um, but going back to what I was just talking about, when you understand what you're using and when you're using, you're in, then in a much better position to, to shift that usage to different times of the day so whether you're a big manufacturing business with energy intensive processes or you're a domestic customer switching your washing machine on doing that at different times of the day will mean that you will pay different amounts for your electricity so if you were with somebody like octopus energy for example you'd pay less to uh, draw electricity down during the middle of the night than you would during those peak periods and it's roughly a third of the price Wow. So that applies for domestic customers and those tariffs are available today. Um, and it also applies to business customers. So we will contract with businesses who can commit to using energy at different times of the day or even generating additional energy um, during some of those peak periods. So there are uh, already financial incentives and products out there that encourage people who understand what their energy usage is to um to, to shift it to different to different patterns and they'll be rewarded financially for doing so i think that's so important because you know well we've seen what's going up on with the price of energy my bill's just gone up myself but you know i think people are going to be trying to find ways to reduce their energy um i recently uh, saw my uh, local landlord he posted how much more it was going to cost him a year um so those kind of tips are really going to help businesses um what do you see happening over the next year do you think we're going to start seeing some changes yeah and well i think i think we've already started to see some so if i if i reflect a little bit back on some of the work i've done over the last 10, 15, 20 years, I think it's probably fair to say that this agenda has been, um, it's been optional. So any, any action that you've seen up until relatively recently has been largely voluntary. And that's whether you're a business, a city, an individual, etc. I think what you now see, uh, and really underpinned by what happened in, in Glasgow, actually at, at COP26 and the, the Glasgow Climate Pact and, and the Paris Agreement before it is, is a really clear message that what comes next as of now is no longer voluntary. So the science is dictating what we need to do as a society and as individuals and as businesses. And therefore this next period is really got to be characterized by action. Action, action, action are the words that you'll hear people like me talking about uh, yeah. repeatedly. So that's not to say that planning and strategizing and target setting and resetting of targets and all that stuff won't need to take place in some shape or form. But 
where we've got to get people focused on right now is this next period up until forever really is focused on getting to net zero yeah and staying at net zero so that you know that's not new we've been on that trajectory for a little while but there's a there's a huge increase in the pace and scale of activity that's needed i'll, I'll give you a couple of numbers just because I've, I've got them yeah, in go front on. of me you look at the numbers of electric vehicles on the roads in somewhere like greater manchester we need a tenfold increase in the number wow. of vehicles between now and three years time so by the start of 2025 there needs to be 10 times more electric vehicles on greater manchester's roads you fast well, I forward. I ask you: Is the infrastructure there, and are they are they available? Um, the the EV the the electric vehicle charging infrastructure is currently lagging. Yeah. Um, the 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 uptake. So I haven't got these numbers in front of me, but something like a seventy percent increase in the number of EVs purchased last year versus the year before. So twenty twenty one wow. versus twenty twenty. But there's only been roughly a 30% increase in the number of EV chargers. Yeah. So that, that's a that's a national picture. And then within that, you'll find regional disparities. So you'll you'll find more EV chargers per head of population in places like London, yeah. for example, than you will in places like the Northwest. So as well as the UK is a wide um the the rate of EV charging infrastructure lagging behind. There are some parts of the UK that are being left even further behind. So mm. there's a, that will be one of the most significant barriers to the uptake of electric vehicles. Yeah. And the other number, sorry, I interrupted you. I no, uh, so, um, uh, so tenfold increase between now and the start of 2025 and then a 40 fold increase between now and the start of 2028. So that's on, on electric vehicles got different versions of that for different technologies but it's for me that's quite it's a helpful illustration of how um having been ticking along at a fairly modest pace for a few years um that pace and scale needs to increase as of right now yeah and i think over the years we'll start to see so much more innovation around solutions for charging your vehicle uh i you know it, Every single day I see new companies coming out um, working in this area. So um, I always like to finish on this question. Uh, you've been in this area for a long time, so I'm sure you've come across some amazing people. But at the moment, who in or before, who inspires you? Who do you follow? Any great books that you're reading? Where do you get your information from? Sure. Uh, I tend not to, to read a huge amount of, of books on the subject matter, not least because it, it, it moves so, so quickly. Um, but I think for me, I, I perhaps won't name any, any specific individuals, but I think the, the people who always really excite me around this agenda are the ones who can place net zero in, in the wider context of how does taking action to reduce carbon emissions provides environmental benefits but actually how does it how might you be able to translate that into something a bit more meaningful for people who feel that's maybe not one of their mainstream concerns so talking about good quality well-paid jobs talking about healthy prosperous communities talking about places where net zero is actually part of their economic strategy and their health strategy um, rather than a slightly off to one side, nice to have environmental um, concern. So anybody who can talk in that kind of language always gets my attention. Um, the exec director of the International Energy Agency will talk in those terms. Mark Carney, uh, ex-governor uh, of the Bank of England, certainly in some of his previous roles, um, talked very much about the, the economic imperative for action on climate change and net zero alongside saving the world, which is also quite a good driver if you're interested in that. So anybody who, who can talk in those terms is interesting to me. And then um, probably the last kind of uh, group of people I'll touch on who I had, a real had the pleasure of working with in a previous role was um, at the time it was the, the Manchester Climate Change Youth Board, but you'll find versions of these kind of groups of young people all over the place. Young people who come to this agenda um, with a real passion and enthusiasm for bringing about change. So um, 
as well as some of the really good campaigning work that goes on, if you like, outside of places like town halls and outside of headquarters, which is really important in, in terms of building some pressure for change. I'm always really impressed by those young people who get themselves inside town halls and inside boardrooms and say, look, we'd like to sit alongside you as senior decision makers and provide some constructive challenge to the current status quo, but also put some solutions on the table. So, you know, I mentioned the, the Manchester Climate Change Youth Board as an example, but you'll find those other versions of those really quite incredibly inspiring people. And if you're not already engaged with or challenging yourself or being challenged by the views of young people in and around you, I'd very much encourage any business to do that because they'll bring a huge amount of energy and passion and um, and fantastic ideas to what you're already doing. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And thank you so much. This has been really inspiring and really insightful as well. And I think uh, a lot of really easy, quick tips for businesses uh, on their journey to net zero. Thank you for your time, Johnny. Really good to speak to you. Thanks for joining me on today's Sustain Talks. Thank you.